Okay. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started. I see at least a few of our fellows uh, on, and uh, we'll try to make this interactive. But I think this is <clears throat> a, a series of uh, lectures for focus on first year fellows. A lot of things are basics, uh, but uh, uh, stop me as we go along so we can have some discussions uh, if we need to. Um, Cardiac shock is very relevant and important uh, in the current world because I think a lot of, of things have, have evolved to <clears throat> pathways and outcomes. But I, I want to point out to the fellows that recent edition of our Debeki journal, where I had the privilege of uh, being the guest editor, um, the good articles, good reviews, well written. So it's a good overview uh, from a lot of people across across the country. So take time to read it. It's not a bad, bad read. It's not too heavy. <clears throat> but to, to set the stage, all of you will end up seeing a patient like this, 50-year-old non-ischemic, low EF. They don't look sick. Blood pressure is borderline. Heart rate is 110. But when you get the labs, the labs speak something. So the, <clears throat> the point I want to make here is Make note of not just the physical appearance of a patient because the compensation will fool you. Make note of the labs and put everything together in the con in context of how aggressive you want to be on these patients. You know, in general, shock is inadequate organ perfusion. And I want to focus on inadequate organ perfusion, uh, which doesn't meet the tissue's oxygen demand and not just the blood pressure because you'll see as we evolve, um, it is, uh, it, it's, you get different flavors of sharp clinical presentation. On the other hand, you want to make sure that you're not misdiagnosing shock because of inadequate tissue perfusion secondary to an obstruction. And I've seen these where you have car emboli in both the legs and the feet are cold and has a weak heart, but we're calling it cardiac shock. It turns out you have emboli. So be careful in what you're using to assess tissue oxygenation. Uh, it was called as a momentary pause in the act or death because these people's outcomes are quite bad. It's overall shock that you're having that small window of opportunity to jump on these patients to change their outcome. The definition <clears throat> is tricky because historically, a lot of these definitions evolved from trials. So if your systolic blood pressure is less than or equal to 90, or MAP is less than or equal to 60, all of the systolic BP is less than 40 from the patient's baseline pressure, provided there are no other confounding factors, like you gave a bunch of cardism. Um, you suspect uh, shock. But hypoperfusion can be present in the absence of significant hypotension. So these classic definitions have been kind of uh, deranged and derailed because you have to remember that these are a couple of examples of trials, the IMPRESS trial and the balloon pump shock 2 trial. For a clinical trial, you want to maintain a particular set of definition. That's not always true in the context of real life. So keep that in mind when you use these definitions of blood pressure. But ideally, the concept is that if it's cardiogenic shock, you want to make sure that it is cardiogenic shock, which means you can be hypotensive with low volume status, so you want to give enough volume to make sure it's not three volume. Um, and this is the definitions that you guys can have in mind, especially the IABP shock 2 trial is used a lot, where you use the blood pressure less than 90 for 30 minutes, uh, pulmonary congestion, signs of hyperperfusion, and then of course lactate greater than two. Altered mental status, urine output, and all these things are essentially reflection of low, uh, perfusion to the body. The sky staging system, uh, the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Intervention, uh, has been put forth relatively recently last year uh, to capture the, um, the, the scope of cardiogenic shock. Just like if you think about it, you have NYHA class two to four in heart failure, and then you have the Intermax classification, and you have the ACC classification. Everything has its purpose. But the ACC classification for heart failure, what it does is it puts the disease process in the context of its evolution and alerts people to think that just because today that somebody doesn't have shock, tomorrow they won't have it. So in that regard, it's probably good to recognize these stages. 
A is again at risk, and these are patients who have, you know, they define as if you know, anybody can be uh, at risk in the hospital with acute decompensated heart failure, which is true. If you look at adhere registry, about 5% of the patients are considered as to be in cardiogenic shock, and I think that's probably under-recognized. But anybody who comes in with acute decompensated heart failure, uh, anybody who comes in with a large MI are actually at a good risk of um, cardiogenic shock, and you have to have vigilance for them. The B stage is beginning, <clears throat> which is relative hypotension or tachycardia without true evidence of hypoperfusion. And then C, they call it as classic, where the patient has hypoperfusion requiring interventions, where you already said, I think this person is in shock, so I want to put them on inotropes, pressors. And then D is deteriorating, which means what you're doing is not working, so you're trying to do more and escalate. And then extremis is pretty much like people who are coding and ongoing CPR and on ECMO. So it's a, it, it's a paradigm which has caught on. I think it's the first time that people have put this in the continuum. Uh, it has its own role. It doesn't help you really define who's at shock when you look at this classic or beginning. You still have to use your clinical judgment and some of the definitions. But if you call it cardiogenic shock, you have to remember that the body will not get enough blood by decreasing cardiac output to the to the organs. Now it's a whole other level of discussion on output from the heart and then perfusion and clamping of the arteries versus not. But but without complicating it, it's important to recognize the contributors to cardiac output because if your cardiac output is low, that's when you define it as cardiogenic shock and. Heart rate, stroke volume are very important, and this leads on to preload and everything, right? Your stroke volume will be low if you are dehydrated, even though your contractility is okay. And there are times where patients come in in cardiogenic shock, and we have massively beta blockaded them. Their heart rate is 50, uh, and their output is 1.2. It's not, you know that heart rate is needed for it. In those individuals, you want to increase the heart rate, not just decrease the uh, improve the contractility by backing up beta blockers. The other classic example of keeping in mind heart rate is patients who have a BIV who come in with cardiogenic shock, you are forcefully uh, controlling the heart rate, especially if they have AV nodal ablation, um, then you have to compensate for that and increase the heart rate. Same thing we talk about this in post-op cardiogenic shock. So remember the contributors of stroke volume, heart rate, leading to cardiac output, and then blood pressure is a reflection. Part of it is cardiac output, part of it is resistance. And then we see that if the resistance goes up, your cardiac output goes down because of the uh, implications of pressure <clears throat> against which the heart is pumping. So basic physiology is important to remember. So you correct the other things because you have to acknowledge that cardiac output is not always reflective of contractility. Contractility is the inherent nature of the heart squeezing, and other factors that are correctable need to be done before you presume that the contractility is the major problem. And of course, when somebody has cardiogenic shock, it doesn't make them immune to have other kinds of shock, or it, you, you can be fooled by other kinds of shock. So always go through the differential of other kinds of shock for two reasons. One is to make sure it's actually not cardiogenic shock, or two is to make sure that you don't have a mixed flavor of both. So a classic example would be somebody with an EF of 20% who has a pneumonia, comes in hypotensive, they could be in septic shock without uh, being in cardiogenic shock state at that particular snapshot. And that's another thing to remember um, that can evolve, right? Today you're in septic shock, you have a low reserve tomorrow, you go into cardiogenic shock, so that's where We'll talk a little on hemodynamic guidance, but always keep in mind that shock hack can be any of these things, and you can go back and forth. You can have a combination of flavors of different. Again, someone comes in with an MI cardiogenic shock, you can have a fusion because you are anticoagulated, have tamponade on top of it. So keep you your mind open that this is an evolving <clears throat> dynamic contribution together in these patients and always work through this algorithm. I'm not going to go into the specifics of the reasons why you have each, but you know we deal with this left column, cardiogenic shock, but obstructive hypovolemic, these are all critical care things that you have to keep in mind. 
So how do you diagnose cardiogenic shock? You have profiles of, uh, of, of flow, right? End of the day, we're saying low perfusion defines as, as shock. <clears throat> and we're using blood pressure as a clinical surrogate marker, but end of the day, if you have evidence that the index is low, and this can be on an echo, this can be on, uh, on stroke volume estimate, but that's what makes it RS1 GANS catheter. That's what makes it cardiac shock. Um, in the heart, you want to assess whether they're warm, cold, or wet. This is the algorithm that all of us know, because there are implications of how you're going to treat them. Right? And congestion can be either in the, in the lungs or in the legs or in the gut. Back to assessment of what we call this cardiac index. Um, Swan GANS catheter, there's, there are sets set of indications which even the guidelines recommend. There's a lot of controversy on using Swan GANS, but I want to remind all of you that the ACC guidelines has a section to tell you when to define hemodynamics. And if you follow that, it actually covers what we want to achieve. Um, the controversy comes when you put in Swan GANS in everybody who doesn't need it. Um, so remember that <clears throat> when you use hemodynamic assessment, the indications in the context of heart failure, these are from the guidelines, are when you have to differentiate whether the wedge and the dyspnea is secondary to hemodynamic or permeable to pulmonary edema. This is where we say, oh, you're having ARDS and you have a low EF, you don't know what's happening. So you, this is, this is one reason where you want to use it appropriately. Differentiating between cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic shock, and especially <clears throat> they say when trial of intravascular volume expansion has failed, or it's obvious they're hypo hypervolemic, and you're not sure if they have infected or not, I think you want to you know, float a swan gas catheter. Guidance for therapy, when you're having both forward and backward heart failure, which, which means when you have things like high SVR, MR, you, you want to really be objective about how you're treating these patients. Um, other reasons of, you know, tamponade is less likely. I think, you know, you can use it to assess the hemodynamics, perioperative management, and then detection of pulmonary hypertension guidance of therapy. If you notice indications, don't talk about cardiogenic shock because of the controversy of the literature. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> I think I might have slides later, but right now the consensus um, of, of most in you know, majority of the individuals in the field of shock is that you need hemodynamic guidance when you're treating cardiogenic shock. Diagnostic is different, and then treating it and guiding it is different. The only other editorial I would give is we get bad rep for cardi for right heart cats and swan gans. Um, you get bad rep because sometimes we overdo it. But like anything in medicine, um, you, you do a right heart cat like last week, and then this week we want to repeat it again, not really knowing what you, what information you want out of it. Also, the other thing I want to make a note is if somebody is in is, is in a shocky state, um, you don't have to has you don't you don't want to optimize them or tune them up to do a Swan GANS catheter. And then the last thing, when you leave a Swan GANS catheter in the ICU. Um, question yourself whether you need it or not. If you're not using in the information for more than 24 hours, um, then there's no need to have continuous uh, monitoring. Question yourself every day, what, am I, what information am I using? Can I take it out? And can I substitute uh, this with some, some other information? Shock is bad. Everybody knows that. This is an old slide, if you notice, from 99. Uh, things have not improved too much. There's some newer data that came out, but it's still reflects the fact that if you start using higher dose inotropes and pressors, people don't do well. And we see this often, patients ending up on like 20 of not epi, 15 of epi, and, and that trend is going away because look at this incremental jump that happens and somewhere around here is where you have to react and say if you're increasing inotropes, you probably need mechanical support. The other thing to keep in mind is it's not just survival, but nowadays we talk about, you know, taking these patients, supporting them, and then taking them to a VAD. You have to remember that the sicker they are, you want to catch them early on, the sicker they are in Intermax 1, once they get a VAD, the worse they do. 
So all these patients that come to us in, in shock and multi-organ failure, you do a five, five impella, bridge them. You know, they're kind of in this one, two range <clears throat> and we have to be careful. Think this has also evolved because now we have better MCS to support, but that strategy of what to do next has to be in mind in these patients. Any questions until now before we jump into management? It's a broad overview, so it's kind of a touching a lot of concepts, but uh, management will go into the machines and uh, MCS and other things. Um, any questions before we jump into that? I have one, Dr. Dimash. It's Priyanka here. Yes, uh, I know swans get a lot of bad rep in terms of being overused. Has there ever been like a study of like clinical judgment versus swan guided either diagnosis or therapy and outcomes that you know of? So the, the, of course, your escape trial um, is one that gets quoted a lot. An escape trial was done for patients who came in with acute heart failure, not in cardiogenic shock. And essentially, escape trial did not show any benefit because anybody who comes in with acute heart failure, if you put in a swan GANS, it makes sense, you, you, the therapeutic decisions that you make. So they got randomized to... Uh, a, Swan GANs versus just clinical judgment. There was no outcome benefit in that, and I don't disagree because you know of the we have we have fifteen hundred patients who get admitted to our hospital with a heart failure, and if everybody gets a Swan GAN, there's no role for it. Um, <clears throat> but if when patients are in cardiogenic shock, the data that's coming out is through registries. Though there's not a randomized trial. But if you look at the uh, uh, the shock registries and also the Impella AMI trial, patients who had a Swan GANS, of course, added on to a protocol-driven uh, treatment because, and I've, I've, I'm sure a lot of other fellows have heard me before, arterial lines don't save patients. Same way uh, PA catheters will not save patients. It depends on who's using it and how you act on it. The difference is Artline gives you one number so you know how to act on it. For PA catheters, you have to go through training people, making sure they understand what to do so there's much, much more level of complexities. But the uh, Detroit Shock Initiative and the cardiogenic shock, National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative are two efforts where they've organized care for acute MI patients in cardiogenic shock. Um, and in that data, you actually see a very good differentiation and outcome uh, benefit in patients. And, and the protocol is the same, right? The pro protocol is if this happens, use this. And, and if this changes, use this. Using swan GANs, outcomes were better. And if you use them properly, then, then that's the consensus. That's the conclusion that if you do a swan and use it properly, people will do better. So if no other questions, we'll move on to management of shock. Um, and maybe a few other pearls in diagnosis is uh, don't let the time of day that you're seeing the patient affect your management. And that's just, this is real medicine, right? It happens in the middle of the night. You know, you say, oh, maybe I'll wait till the morning. Attending is sleeping. But keep in mind that some of these MCS treatments if you do it earlier, there's a chance people do better, at least in my experience. Um, <clears throat> the other part is when you're making management decisions, put the entire picture in place, not just the symptoms, not just lab while you make decisions. Also keep in mind everything we do has risk, so you wanna weigh the risk and benefit balance of it. So <clears throat> when you, this in this algorithm, you kind of can walk through this. Uh, I think this is from one of the guidelines if I remember right. Um, but make sure you are factoring in that low output state, which is what is cardiogenic shock, but make sure you are correcting hypovolemia. Assessment of hypovolemia becomes important. And then if somebody's got acute pulmonary edema, you treat that. Um, Lasix and all these, also not just diuresing them, but you have to keep in mind that it becomes a vicious cycle as you decrease their lung issues, their oxygenation gets better, the work of breathing gets better, then the cardiac impact gets better. So it's a ripple effect. If they have blood pressure room, well, nitroglycerin is a good choice. Um, <clears throat> the butamine can be used when the blood pressure is on the, on the lower end. 
DOPA is used in the short term, but to be honest, there's much more data now to suggest that in cardiogenic shock, it's a suggestion that norepi might be a better first choice. And you have uh, you have two trials, SOAP2 and then SOAP1. SOAP1 was some analysis where they showed norepi might be superior to dopamine. So dopamine's kind of fallen out of favor and and then I'll 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 probably stick to that unless you have no other choice to, to use. But the concept is if somebody is so hypotensive, they cannot tolerate dobutamine, they might not tolerate milanone because because of the afterload. You have to get the pressure up while you're working this out. Um, <clears throat> and this is all again focused on what to do in the acute setting. Um, not every seems to be winning overall. You can use dobutamine if you can tolerate blood pressure. If you're too hypotensive, of course, you can't. Uh, the other thing to remember in this situation is assess the hypoxia. If somebody's work of breathing is bad, use non-invasive ventilation very early. No one's going to die of a BiPAP. So put them on a BiPAP, decrease the work of breathing. Your cardiac output that comes from the respiratory muscles uh, in general is high, and then when the work of breathing increases, it can go up to almost 25 to 30 percent of your cardiac output will go goes to the uh, respiratory muscle. Uh, and the other thing you want to remember is if you leave them hypoxic and continue to struggle, they're going to crash, and if they crash, you're going to lose them. So use non-invasive breathing very early. Um, and especially when they come to the cat lab. If you're going to put them flat when you're suspecting high wedge pressure, put them on a BiPAP so that you, you don't run into that issue. Sometimes you, it's probably better to do an elective intubation to have things under control, uh, but you have to be mindful during intubation. You'll induce, and if the anesthesia guys are not uh, careful with that, you, the people might crash. But keep in mind that shock is made worse by other things that are happening to the body. <clears throat> the HFSA recommendation is kind of a little archaic. There's no recommendation for dopamine, but I, as I told you, norepi seems to be better than dopamine and cardiogenic shock in those trials. The butamine neuron, I mean, you can use. Um, the reality is you'll always, as much as people are going against inotropes and, and pressors, the reality is this, this becomes the first line most of the times because either patients are in an outside hospital or in the ER. Um, but I want to remind all of you again, <clears throat> think about MCS early in these patients. I think it's reasonable to put them on inotropes if their uh, perfusion is not too bad. Um, and there's no, there's no criteria right now to say do MCS in everybody because you have to be, if we have clinically gotten away by putting people on inotropes. But if someone's on like three of the butamine or five of the butamine and they're feeling better, then that's fine. You can leave them on it. But if you're adding medications and pressors and going down this path, trigger a placement of a mechanical <coughs> circulatory support as a first line treatment as much as possible. There are a plethora of devices that are available now, right? The, the interventional tie box has it expanded than before, you know, balloon pump, impella, tandem, ECMO, and this are all percutaneously placed. And then surgical placement, you have impella 5.0 and 5.5 right now. And then cent uh, central center mag and then central ECMOs are more surgically placed. I didn't put peripheral ECMO under surgical place because anybody can place it. <clears throat> So the, the bigger discussion is the shock algorithm, and this is a 2017 scientific statement I would guide you guys to. For the first time, here is where they put forth together that you have to keep in mind where the patient's going. Are you trying, and, and in one essence, um, you know, somebody, one of the heart failure guys at uh, you can know, at Rami put it together, you're kind of buying time with MCS in most of these situations. You have to ask yourself, what am I buying time for? Of course, you want the patient to live, but for the patient to live, you're buying time to decide whether the heart will recover. Most of the times, this is reperfusion and the probability of recovery. Um, or are you buying time just to uh, give the family some time to accept the reality and they pass away in palliative care? 
there because you already know they're not going to make it. Or are you going to buy time to get them better, to get them to a durable VAD and durable transplant? So this is where the shock team discussion, early uh, initiation of MCS and a plan moving forward is, is very important in shock. Um, and then as you're treating shock, I think your monitoring is what makes a big difference. Say you put somebody on dobutamine and then you walk away for 24 hours and they're going downhill, then it's not going to you know, be a good thing. So it's the adequacy of your intervention that's more important than, uh, uh, than what you do and assessing lactate response. There's some suggestion that uh, beyond a lactate of three, mortality really spikes up. So some people argue that if your lactate is so high, maybe you should be more aggressive up front, but there's no data for that. When there's no data, you just have to make sure what you do is working. So follow up on a regular basis. You check lactate in a couple hours. If it's not getting better or your pressure requirements are increasing, then you want to say that it's not working. Optimize the milieu for the heart, which means that both cardiac and non-cardiac. If your pH is 7.1, no matter what you do, the heart's going to die. And we see this quite often post-operatively. Right? People come out. The heart's needing dobutamine, epi, but your acidosis is not being corrected, you're going to get worse. And also, that, that's also another lesson for uh, people in the lab. You spend a long time resuscitating, putting in a tandem, impella, but you spend two hours in there. No one checked an ABG or medically optimized it. By the time the patient goes to the, um, back to the CCU, after two hours, your pH is 6.4 and the patient's dead. So keep in mind that you have to monitor the milieu as you're treating, assess recovery of other organs, identify the complications that can negate the trajectory, like bleeding, um, and then monitor for recovery of the heart if you're going down that path. I think that's really your purpose of monitoring. I also divide cardiogenic shock into <clears throat> kind of three logistic areas. Um, and if you... And I, I mean, I don't think people have talked about this in this regard, but in a post STEMI cardiogenic shock, there's probably the most evidence over there on unloading recovery systems of care. And it's also a much more organized area that you can do more. Um, and you have to keep in mind because what you do and how you uh, optimize makes a difference. If you're in the cat lab in the middle of the night, somebody needs a mechanical support you're able to do an impella, it makes sense to do an impella instead of doing a balloon pump and coming back after three hours, right? So those are logistic realities. Um, <clears throat> post cardiotomy cardiogenic shock is a whole area which has not been well studied, but we see that a lot with rats and transplants and when we go to the OR, but in the OR, mostly the surgeons kind of control the interventions and a lot of times it's a surgical device, but you will be engaged into these patients and you, have, you still have to keep that perspective of what to do next and how to diagnose using hemodynamics. And then <clears throat> a lot of what we see is acute and chronic heart failure. And the logistics again are different because this is a patient who's on the floor slowly going downhill. This is a patient in the ICU who, uh, who came in with shortness of breath and needs intubation and then going downhill. So the logistics here and your vigilance is completely different. Also, I think, I personally think even though there's no physiological study, is that the physiology of these acute and chronic heart failure is very different than post STEMI cardiogenic shock or even probably acute myocarditis. I feel like these acute and chronic heart failure patients have more neurohormonal changes, which kind of make me believe if you, you know, inotropes sometimes work, balloon pump seems to work better in these situations than in an acute myocarditis state. So there is some physiology which is not being explored. So you can't, the reason why that's important to recognize is you can't go around quoting post-STEMI cardiogenic shock literature and apply them to acute and chronic heart failure because they're different physiologically. Um, this is uh, Barry's work that uh, Dr. Trackenberg published and the importance of optimizing for the next level. So even though if somebody, uh, is on a bunch of inotropes, they send them from outside. Um, you know, there's sometimes I've had referring doctors call and say, oh, you guys are going to do that anyway, so I'm not going to do a balloon pump. I mean, they don't add up. They're not the same. You want to tune people up, optimize, use whatever you need to to get them better. And this paper, Trachtenberg essentially showed that 
if you change the MEL in this graph from a high MEL score, high MEL means you're quite sick with multi-organ. If you make them high MEL to low MEL by timely interventions, their risk is as good as they came in with low MEL at post vac So when we are bridging these patients, you want to be more aggressive up front so you don't end up in multi-organ failure and fall off the curve and never come back to low MEL state. <clears throat> Conceptually, one of the other things to, to remember is for decades together, we've focused shock on the body. That's why you hear everybody talk about what is the urine output, what is mentation, what is LFTs, what is renal function, lactic acid. All this is important, except if you don't keep in mind that in cardiogenic shock, the heart is dying, you're not going to be mindful of the fact that you can make the lactic acid better by putting them on a bunch of inotropes, but you're going to increase the uh, uh, load on the heart by making it consume more work and oxygen. So that concept of unloading the heart, resting the heart, either for recovery or improvement is extremely important to acknowledge. So that's why when you're monitoring the improvement of a, of a patient, it's not just the body and the parameters here. You want to make sure the LVDP is coming down, CVP is coming down, the, the resistance on the heart is better so that you're giving the heart the best atmosphere hemodynamically and metabolically to do the best that it can with its limited reserve. Especially if recovery is a goal, then you want to make sure you provide that. Um, I'm sure you guys are not surprised. I'm showing at least one PV loop. There's a lot more to come. Um, but pressure volume loop, this is a left ventricular pressure volume loop without going into too many details. And this is a right ventricular pressure volume loop. Very, very distinctly different. The properties of the right ventricle are very different. So majority of her heart failure, cardiogenic shock is LV failure. Remember that there's another ventricle. So if somebody is not doing well, despite an impella that you did, a balloon pump you did, Either it's not adequate or you want to keep the other ventricle in mind. Same thing, same thing with RV failure. If somebody comes in with that RV failure, keep in mind that the LV can also be bad. So keep an eye for both of them. Um, we talked about the swan gans and discussed a li little bit. Again, don't hit the swans. Make sure you guys use it in the right atmosphere. I also want to warn that don't overuse it or take it out if you're not using it so that you don't perpetuate infections. These are all the old controversies of uh, SWAN, and I think we should move on from it and use it in the right setting for these patients. This is the data that I was telling. <clears throat> it's a little old. I think there's more publications that came out. I didn't see a full paper from this, but the CVAD registry and the IQ database both showed that if you use hemodynamic monitoring, you actually have a survival benefit, which I think for the first time is a concept that's there. So quickly going over the, uh, the, the, the me mechanical support. We use a lot of balloon pumps. Intratic balloon pump is a counter pulsation device for the first year fellows. But the, for the first year fellows, the basic physiology to remember is for a balloon pump. Just imagine this is a heart, this is a balloon. If you look at me, um, both are moving at the same um, phase. So if this is a heart, in diastole, the balloon inflates. Right, so when it inflates in diastole, it's pushing blood back, so your coronary perfusion improves. And then in systole, the balloon deflates, so it unloads the heart and decreases systemic vascular resistance. So if you just remember that it moves together and then tied up to inflation deflation, the two objectives of the balloon pump will be clear for you. Um, it's a, it, you have the tip that sits, so it goes through the groin for the most part, Heart percutaneously, and uh, as many of you know, we have <coughs> published and shown we also do percutaneous balloon pump through the axillary artery, mostly the uh, uh, left axillary to avoid the arch and cause strokes. If you do surgical placement, sometimes we do it from the right. Um, but the balloon essentially sits like what you see here uh, in the aorta above the renals, right um, up below the by uh, the ascending, the arch uh, ends uh, timing in such a way that it unloads the heart. On x-ray, you see the tip here. And uh, if you put an axillary balloon pump, 
the positioning is still the same except that it is inverted coming from here. So the tip that you see here looks different. For axillary balloon pump, this looks smaller because you have inverted it. For a groin balloon pump, this tip looks a little more radio-opaque and bigger. <clears throat> we talked about the physiology here. The other pumps which need uh, and the advantage of the balloon pump is it can be done at bedside through the groin very easily. Um, axillary balloon pump should never be done in a context of an acute setting. It has its own implications. Always do a groin balloon pump and decide whether you need a long-term balloon pump or not. Uh, axillary is not supposed to be used loosely that way. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the, the other pumps that to to know uh, our the tandem heart um, is a pump that we're not using as much, but it still has its role. In the tandem heart, you see the cannula here that goes through the venous side, goes into the right atrium, cuts across through a, 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 a transeptal puncture into the left atrium. So it's taking oxygenated blood from the left atrium, comes out into this pump, and the pump then pushes it back into the arterial circulation into the iliacs. So essentially, it, you need lungs which work well so that the oxygenated blood comes out and, and pumps. You're kind of bypassing the circuit here. The <clears throat> impella pump to the right here is a trans-aortic pump. Um, this chart gives you an idea of, of uh, the, the flows and uh, the uh, theoretical flow that you get. Impella 2.5 is kind of, we don't use it as much in shock. You still use it as a high risk PCI. 2.5 generates 2.5. CP generates about four liters. And then tandem five and five, five generates five and five and a half liters. Tandem heart can go up to four and a half liters. Peripheral ECMO can go up to five liters. Um, so we were talking about the tandem heart where the circuit is what I described earlier. Um, and uh, this is a console on the machine. The dial, you dial it up, the RPMs go up. Um, and here is an example where at two or five liters, um, you see the PA diastolic is you know, 59 or 28. You increase it, the blood pressure incre increases. The wedge could decrease. You have to be mindful of RV in this as a higher RPMs. You see that the RA pressure goes up. So in all of the LV devices, you should be mindful of the um, right ventricle. This is an impella device that we were talking about. It's a trans-aortic pump. All, the, all of them, two, five, uh, four liters, and the five and five, five, is a, uh, essentially have a rotor here, and the rotor sucks blood, and this is sitting in the LV, and then pushes blood out of the outflow here, which uh, is, uh, all of you are able to see my arrow, right, as I'm pointing? Yes, Dr. Bermash. Okay. So it comes out of the outflow here. Um, now, the 5.5 five currently doesn't have the pigtail, so it makes it easier to put it in, is the theory. So essentially, small rotor suction pumping out here. <clears throat> the hemodynamic benefits of unloading the LV is, is very different for the impella compared to the balloon pump. So hence, I think, the, the benefit discussions in STEMI, but this is an example when you of the pressure volume loop, the green is a normal heart, the kind of, uh, I guess, dirty green, the small one is a cardiogenic shock state. But when you put an impella device and unload the LV, the LV end diastolic pressure that you notice here comes down quite effectively. It makes sense, right? Balloon pump doesn't unload it from inside the LV. Also, it decreases the energy consumption by the fact that the area inside the pressure volume loop is smaller. And this triangle shape is always the most energy efficient uh, uh, for any ventricle. In fact, the RV looks a little like this and it's considered to be more energy efficient. So these concepts um, are, are important to recognize because you can't compare balloon pump and impella in the same setting. So this unloading probably is what is helping and resting the heart is, I think, in my personal opinion, is helping the 
um, LV recover better in a STEMI situation, hence this whole recovery concept with an impella probably better in a, in a STEMI setting than a balloon pump. But, but not sure if this is equal uh, uh, to presumptions in other settings of uh, um, acute or chronic heart failure. The impeller device, as I said, I'm not going to go into the details, but all these are the studies that are quoted for impeller. Um, <clears throat> impeller works well, but the, 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 these trials that impeller and balloon pump were studied, you have to remember that this is all in a, in a most of it is in a post STEMI setting. In some, in fact, there was no difference. So it doesn't mean balloon pump is as good as impeller here. You don't talk about the Protect 2 trial. So keep in mind the evidence here is mostly relevant to uh, uh, the S STEMI state. And if someone on the bedside in the middle of the night, you need to put a balloon pump, you can't quote this data and say it doesn't work. You still can do the balloon pump, but if it's not enough or you need to upgrade to an impella, then probably you want to do a bigger impella, either the CP or the 5.0, because 2.5 probably is not any good in the, in the setting of cardiogenic shock. Um, we use a lot of the 5.0 <coughs> axillary impella. It's a surgical device. So uh, you see this patient here where the impella is going through the right axillary. Um, so putting somebody under anesthesia, doing this vascular procedure comes with a risk. So it's not, again, done in an emergent situation. After people get stabilized, we then upgrade it to the 5.5 using this as ambulation benefit to uh, getting them to the next level. Um, the console that you guys see is different for the CP and the 5.5, the 5 and the 5.0 and the 5.5. So currently the 5.5 actually, this is not updated, has a cardiac output and power output calculation. I, I'm, I'm not sure if you're noticing that often. It has to be calibrated in the cath lab and the index put in so that it comes out, but that's something we should probably talk about independently specific to Impella. Um, <clears throat> it's 1253, so I'm going to talk about one concept about aortic valve opening and pulse stability, <clears throat> and then probably wrap up. Um, I have to go to clinic, a uh, patient at one o'clock. This is a patient with a tandem heart. Um, this patient, you see a mean perfusion pressure of 84 without any aortic valve pulse stability, right? This is just like a VAD, because all these temporary devices are continuous flow devices. Adding mildrenon essentially added this pulse stability, which is though intermittent, it does wash out the aortic root. And that concept, even though this is a tandem heart patient, this concept is extremely relevant when you put a VA ECMO in, especially peripheral ECMO. And to talk about the VA ECMO, ECMO cannulation, in this picture, you can see goes into the venous side where typically it's left in the um, RA or maybe a little below here. You want to make sure it's not put too far in and then, you know, goes through the PFO or then sits against the wall. And then it sucks blood out and you have a pump and an oxygenator and then it pumps oxygenated blood back into the um, iliacs. So it's taking over both heart and lung circulation, hence it's an AV ECMO, which is completely different than a VV ECMO, which we're not going to talk about today, because VV ECMO is only for respiratory failure and oxygenation. The concept of unloading and afterload, venting the LV aortic valve opening is all what's reflected here, that as you put in an ECMO, you see this uh, um, curve, pressure volume loop curve, move to the right and become narrow. The narrower a curve uh, the previ loop is, the higher the resistance. And this shows that your EDP, in fact, goes up and your resistance increase. As you increase the ECMO flow, and the flow in the body is something that improves. So say here, for example, the same thing is reflected in real time. See how the uh, pressure volume loop moved to the right, became narrow. Of course, your pressure improved. Diabetic pressure went from 59 to 96. Um, except that your end diastolic pressure actually got worse. And the MVO2 that's listed here is energy consumption. The energy consumption went from 22 uh, you know, um, ml of oxygen per minute up to 24, which is what happens. And 
essentially when this happens, this is a patient with an ECMO, your lungs can flood because the LVDP is increased, the aortic valve is opening intermittently. And if you are not mindful of it, you'll end up going into ARDS and everything else. So how do you unload the um, LV? You can either use a balloon pump, you can use an impeller, or sometimes if somebody has good pulse stability, we've not needed to use any of these things. The concept is to acknowledge and be mindful of the pulse stability so you don't lose ground in this. This is an echo example that I think I've shown before to many, but this is an intra-op TE. Look at all the smoke and the clots here. This is what happens if your aortic valve is barely opening here. And uh, in this patient, you know, you promote the contractility just with inotropes, and then all that haziness goes away, except this patient died of a stroke because those clots probably went up or they were already in the brain. So early on, that's what you need to do. I'm going to stop here um, and uh, see if you have any questions. I'm, I think specifics about mm -hmm. hemodynamics and all these things is probably its own lecture. Okay. So there's no comments. Just, I guess, a couple of things for the fellows. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Kim has been working on a shock pathway as an algorithm that we all can agree. Um, typically, in the middle of the night, uh, if you if you if someone needs um, shock uh, algorithm treatment, um, that we have a shock phone which essentially goes to the heart failure MD on call, and uh, depends on who's on call. If the interventional guys. Are on call, they can take care of things and then they can engage us to have a decision and discussion on what to do next. But we need to continue to promote that multidisciplinary discussion. Um, at what time do you do it, do it is, is different. Hopefully, we'll get to a point where we have a <clears throat> like a STEMI pager, we'll have a shock pager where everybody gets activated. Right now, we're not doing that, that yet. Um, keep in mind. Um, when somebody is crashing, and you know, we didn't talk about it today, but it's almost like emergency shock and ECPR, ECMO utilization, these are very time sensitive. Um, so you, you want to make those phone calls early if you are suspecting somebody needs that. Um, we'll probably have a separate talk on ECPR and ECMO and, and cannulations and getting access early on and maybe address some of the nuances for VADs and transplants in, uh, in another talk. Okay, so thank you. If no one has any questions or comments, I'm gonna log off.